hello, um, as they have graciously pointed out. My name is Noah Verbeek. I'm a freshman at Calvin College, and I am the proud son of today's speaker. <laughs> It is my pleasure to welcome all of you to the January series of 2016, to hear from my father, the man I have looked up to all my life, and listen to the amazing work that God is doing in my home country of Honduras. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones. While you are doing that, we would like to give a special welcome today to the guests at four of our 48 remote webcast sites, San Jose, California, the LCC International University of Lithuania, Wyckoff, New Jersey, and East Lansing, Michigan. We will be gathering questions today through Q&A cards available with our ushers and by email or Twitter. So feel free to think of these questions during the presentation and send them in. Our moderator, Karen Sopi, will gather the questions and present them at the end of If Time is Allowed. And now, if you will please pray with me. Gracious and loving Father, thank you for the opportunity you have given us today to hear from Kurt Verbeek. We pray that we will hear your voice and see your hand through the work that the Association for a More Just Society is doing in Honduras. Please give each and every one of us the courage and determination that it takes to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you in our own lives. In your name, amen. And now, Don DeGraff, the Director of Off-Campus Programs, will introduce our guest. Welcome to Calvin. We're glad you're here. Every year, the January series highlights speakers who are directors and founders of organizations that do amazing work for justice in the United States or around the world. Also every year, the January series invites one inspirational Calvin faculty member to describe his or her work. Today, these two kinds of speakers come together in one remarkable person. Dr. Kurt Verbeek joined the Calvin Sociology Department in 1996 after receiving a PhD in Developmental Sociology from Cornell University. He was drawn to this degree following six years' work in Honduras with his wife Joanne for World Renew, a development organization. Kurt and Joanne lived in Honduras currently, where they direct and teach in Calvin's Honduras, in one of Honduras, Calvin's Honduras semesters. The fall semester program has become known as the Justice Semester, and many students have described how life-changing their experiences have been. In fact, this morning I was challenged to just to do a quick shout out to, if you are alumni of a Calvin Honduras Semester program, either Spanish or, or Justice, can you just put up your hand? Okay, so we have them in front. <laughs> As one recent student described, um, recently described when talking about her semester, she wrote, I realized what it feels like to be a stranger. I had to come to terms with violence and poverty that has never been part of my reality before. I had to ask questions and seek answers about God and about justice and mercy. I learned to find hope in the midst of darkness. But in addition to his teaching, or perhaps more accurately as an extension of his teaching work, Kurt is one of the founders and co-director of, of the Association for a More Just Society, or AGS. This organization is devoted to promoting social justice through a variety of methods, which you'll hear about more about today. The work of AJS did not proceed from some specific preset formula, but through careful listening, hard thinking, genuine partnership, and brave action. Kurt and Joanne took one obedient step forward at a time, moving into one of the most, quote unquote, dangerous neighborhoods in Tegus, hearing the longing of new friends, opening their eyes and hearts to learn about explo exploitation and murder rates in their neighborhood, and partnering with an amazing group of brave Honduran Christians. There were times of discouragement and grief, but with the conviction that perfect love casts out fear, and that God asked Christians to be bold, the work has continued, one amazing step at a time. 
Kurt will be available after today's talk in the audience of the West Lobby if you would like to greet him. We'd also like to, uh, Kelvin College would also like to give, um, say thank you to Barnes and Thornburg for underwriting today's presentation. Will you now please join me in welcoming my colleague and friend, Kurt Verbeek. Good afternoon. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Noah, wherever you are. <laughs> I have a history of crying when I speak publicly. <laughs> so if any of you had money on that happening again, getting Noah to introduce me was a very smart idea. <laughs> I feel like I'm right on the edge. It really is an honor to be here. Uh, I want to shape my talk today around three stories. I'm going to start with the hardest and end with the happiest. 2001, as Don said, uh, my family and I moved up to Nueva Suyapa. We found out later it was one of the most violent neighborhoods in all of Honduras. We moved up there in part because my best friend and co-founder of AGS, Carlos Hernandez, had moved up there a few years earlier. And I came home one night, and Anna and Noah were crying, very upset, and ended up figuring out that the father of their classmates had been killed the, that early that morning. So I went over to Carlos's house. He was the principal of their school. And I asked what had happened, and he said, yeah, it was true, that the father of the two kids sold fruits and vegetables out of the back of a pickup truck. And he was going down about 4.30 in the morning, probably had about $100 in his pocket. And two guys, three guys with ski masks showed up with a pistol, and they said that he had to hand over all his money. So he handed over the cash, and after they took the cash, they shot him in the head and killed him. So I went back home, calmed down my kids, we prayed with them, we prayed for the family, and honestly, over the next couple days, I don't remember thinking much more about the incident. But three days later, the widow showed up in Carlos Hernandez's office. He was the principal of the school, somebody that she trusted. And she said, we know who, we knew, we know who did it. The, a neighbor of ours saw the three guys when they came around the corner, and she saw when they took their ski masks off. Not only did she see them, they're neighbors of ours. They live two or three blocks away. We know their names. We know where they live. And the witnesses are willing to testify. What should we do? So if you're in the United States, what do you do? You call 911. Maybe in this case, you'd, you'd take the witnesses to the police station. They'd give their testimony. The bad guy should get arrested. But in Honduras, that might happen. We might talk to good cops, and the guys would end up arrested in a couple of days. But it could also happen that you could talk to a bad cop. And those bad cops, instead of going and arrest the bad guys, would go and meet with the bad guys. And they would tell them who the witnesses are, and who the widow is, and that we're involved. And instead of getting arrested, these bad guys might show up on our door, or on the widow's door, and threaten or worse. So we started trying to call friends and acquaintances. Do you know a police officer who can help us with this? Who should we talk to? And every, everybody said, no, we don't know somebody. We'll, we'll, fig we'll try and figure something out. It ended up almost three months went by. And these three bad guys ended up killing an off-duty police officer. And the other police officers were nearby and saw it happen, and they chased the guys. They took off. They ended up holding themselves up in a house, there was a standoff, helicopters, the whole big deal. One of the bad guys was killed and two were arrested. So a few days later, Carlos and I were in his living room. And we were talking about, there were bad guys in our neighborhood, but these were really bad guys. And we said, yeah, and I said, I know that just around our church, they killed X and Y and Z. 
And Carlos is like, I didn't even know about Z, but I knew about A and B and C. And we ended up investigating a little further. And we ended up figuring out that after we knew who they were, they killed 13 more men. That, that's, it just still feels bad to say that. We knew who they were, and they still killed 13 more people, and we didn't stop them. So you could say, how is that possible? It might even be harder to believe that it's possible if I told you that Micah 6.8 is one of my favorite verses. Micah 6.8 says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to act justly and to love mercy and walk humbly with our God. God requires me to act justly. I knew who these guys were, and I didn't stop them. And like, again, like, how is that possible? And, and I know it was a little bit about fear. I mean, I was afraid. I was afraid for myself, for my kids. I was afraid for the widow and the witnesses. But I really don't think that the biggest problem was fear. The biggest problem was that we couldn't trust the justice system that was supposed to protect us. The police and the justice system is there, but it had been corrupted. And if we didn't know how to trust them, what were we supposed to do? And I got a PhD, and I got money, and I got connections, I had experience in this stuff, and I didn't know what to do. And if I don't know what to do, what are my poor neighbors supposed to do? Some of them can't read and write. They don't have money. They don't have connection. They don't have... How is that justice system supposed to work for them if I can't even get it to work for me? And I don't think I'm the exception. And I know Honduras is not the exception. This is happening all over the world, that the poor are suffering and dying because the police and the justice system, which is supposed to protect us, isn't and sometimes is even the source of the violence. And that's not the worst of it. I think the worst of it is that most of us are doing nothing to fix it. We're not even talking about this issue. And this sort of violence and corruption and systemic injustice is not just killing people, not just killing my neighbors, not just killing people around the world. We're suffering in all sorts of ways. We have a neighbor woman who's was making pillows in her house, and she took out a loan and started a small business. She ended up with two sewing machines, two employees. She was so proud. She was doing so well. And then the gang showed up on her door. And they said, you're going to start giving us every week all of your profits, or we're going to burn down your house. And she came to us. She said, what do I do? And we're like, you've got to close down your business. You, you, you can't give them the money and they'll burn your house down if you don't. So just close down the business and they'll leave you alone. There's teenage girls in Honduras and there's teenage girls around the world that have to drop out of high school because they're afraid of sexual violence. My neighbors and neighbors around the world stop going to evening church services because they're afraid to walk home at night. The police are not protecting them. So violence is hurting the poor in all sorts of ways. And this sort of violence and the broken security systems are strangely not on the agendas of us, of, of many of us who are trying to help the poor. So look at the websites and the brochures of the organizations that you support. World Vision, Compassion, World Renew. These organizations are helping the poor get loans and start small businesses but they're not helping them figure out what to do when the gangs show up or how to get the police to protect them. This issue of violence and the corruption of our security system, it's not on the agenda. It's, it's not in the curriculum of Calvin College. I got a PhD from Cornell in development sociology. It's basically, I got a PhD in how to help the poor. I never had a single class about this issue of violence and broken justice systems. We're not talking about it in our churches. There's probably few of the churches represented here that are working on this issue of violence in your neighborhoods. 
Our missionaries aren't addressing it. Our short-term missions don't address it. So, so why aren't we talking about it? Honestly, I talked about this with somebody yesterday. I don't know. I don't know the an- I don't, it, it seems like this is a big issue and that people know it, and yet it, it's not on the how, how do we help the poor agenda yet. I think at least in part it's fear. World Vision, Compassion, the United Nations, the World Bank, they say if we get involved in this stuff, our staff might get killed. Somebody will get hurt. Our organizations will be damaged. So I, I know, again, in part it's fear, but I think it's more than that. I think at least as Christians, part of the issue is we have a watered-down view of justice, of what justice is. When God tells us in Micah 6, 8 to act justly, we've watered down what that means. And I'll talk about more of that in a minute. But most importantly, I think that this issue in violence and corruption, we've decided that it's too. It's too complicated. It's too hard. It's too political. It's going to take too long. It's too controversial. It's too dangerous. And we need to ask ourselves, who benefits if we believe that? Who wins if we believe that it's too hard of a topic to take on? If violence and corruption is too big of an issue for us to take on, who wins? The corrupt and the criminals. Because they get to keep doing just what they've been doing. And nobody's going to stop them. If we're not, who's going to stop them if we don't? So if we believe it's too hard, it's going to take too long, it's too complicated, they're going to just keep doing their bad stuff. And what we often do as Christians, and not just Christians, instead of trying to take these issues on head on, we build parallel systems. So the public schools aren't working, well, let's, we'll build a private school. The public hospitals are a mess. Well, we'll build a private clinic. Or we'll build an orphanage. And the idea is that that's, you know, building a private hospital, instead of the really hard work of fixing the public system, it's much easier to build a, to build a private school or a private hospital. Any of you have ever tried to do that? No, it's not true. There's nothing easy about starting and keeping running a private hospital, private school over the years and getting the bills paid. So I think we need to rethink what justice means. I googled this a couple months ago. There are 1,379 references to justice in the Bible. 1,379. Twice as many as love. Now that surprised me. And I'm just picking out a few, a few of my favorites. 2 Samuel 12, Nathan goes to David. Nathan's confronting David because David slept with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, ended up killing her husband. Awful story. But Nathan has to say to David, I am going to bring calamity on you. Remember, Nathan's a prophet. David's the king. The kings killed lots of prophets. Nathan had no idea what David was gonna, how David was going to respond. Nathan is brave. He's taking risks. He's confronting injustice. Amos 2, 6 and 7. And Amos says, God says, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy, the needy for a pair of sandals. They're that cheap. Again, it's a prophet, Amos, And he's speaking to the elite of his day, the powerful people. Again, easily could have Amos killed, being brave, taking risks. Then we get to Jesus, Matthew 23, 27. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees. You are like whitewashed tombs, you snakes, you brood of vipers, How will you escape being condemned to hell? If I talked like that, my mom would have washed my mouth out with soap. (laughs) This is Jesus talking to the pastors and priests of his day. The biggest religious authorities. Look how he talks to them. And then Jesus goes into the temple. He overturns the tables And in the Matthew version, he makes a whip. 
Like, I wish I had that in Sunday school, right? We get to turn over the tables. We all make whips and bring them home and show our mom and dad, this is what Jesus did. (laughs) But it was, it was Jesus, and he was in the temple acting like that. I think it shows how passionate Jesus and the prophets and God are about justice. And then we have to ask ourselves if we haven't watered down what justice means to us. So what is justice? I visit churches and colleges across the U.S., and lots of them say, yeah, we have a justice committee. We have a food pantry for the poor. We're digging wells in Africa. We got a job training program. And it starts to feel like everything is justice. I think the famous Chinese, Chinese must have lots of proverbs, but I think I only know one. (laughs) This Chinese proverb helps us understand this. The idea, give a man a fish and he will eat for a day, right? The idea, we often call this charity. People need food, shelter, housing, water, and we help them out. People in Flint right now need water. After a hurricane, after a tornado, after a war, charity is necessary. But the Chinese proverb goes on, teach someone to fish, and they'll eat for a lifetime. The idea we often call development, that the poor need to learn something. We can help the woman start the pillow business, or start a tortilla business. We can give them a loan, and that's good, that's development. They'll be able to support themselves and their family, and they won't need to keep getting charity. But what's the difference between charity and development? and justice. So what happens if we teach the person to fish? They know how to fish, but then the gang comes along and steals their boat and their fishing poles. Or what if a corrupt mayor comes along and fences in the public lake and says, you poor people can't fish here anymore, this is now my lake. Those are examples of injustice. Injustice is when an individual or a group misuses power to take another's life or liberty or dignity or the fruits of their love and labor. So justice work for me is fighting injustice. The poor have a right to fish on that public lake. They have a right to their boats and the poles. And it's our responsibility as society to make sure that they can exercise that right. So my shorthand for justice work is justice work that almost always makes somebody mad. It's about power. And when you confront someone who is abusing power, they're going to get mad. And if nobody gets mad, it's probably not justice work. So when my neighbor was killed, I could have done charity. We could have offered the family food to cover the funeral expenses, and that would have been good. We could have done development. We could have helped the widow to to get out a loan and start a tortilla business. That would have been good too. Nobody would have got mad at us for doing those things. And they would have been good things. But if we help catch the bad guys and put them in jail, they're going to get mad. But we would have saved 13 lives. And for me, that's justice work. To stop the powerful, the criminals and the corrupt from abusing their power. So what did we do? At the very beginning, Carlos and I really knew next to nothing about this. But we promised each other we were going to do something. We ended up hiring three staff. We hired an investigator, a lawyer, and a psychologist. So the investigator was an ex-cop. And what does an ex-cop know that we don't know? They know a lot of things we don't know. But... The trouble was, remember, we didn't know who we could talk to. We didn't know which cops we could trust. An ex-cop knows who are the good cops and who are the bad cops. And what we did is we, he made sure that all of our cases, all of our witnesses went to good cops and that they would work hard on those cases and keep us safe. And our lawyer was an ex-prosecutor and he did the same thing. So we brought together our witnesses with police we knew we could trust. 
But we ended up finding out something we didn't know. We already knew that the neighbors didn't trust the police. But we ended up finding out that the police also didn't trust the neighbors. Because the police officer has a family. He's got a wife and three kids. And what are we asking him to do? We're saying, oh yeah, Mr. Police Officer, there's three guys in this house and they have guns and we know they've killed before, but we want you to go and arrest them. We're asking him to risk his life. And he's got a wife and kids too. And what he knows from a lot of experience is that it's very unlikely that those witnesses are going to show up when they have to. The witnesses have to show up in 48 hours and pick the bad guys out of a lineup. Then they have to show up in six months for a pretrial. They have to show up in 18 months for the trial. And remember, our witnesses live right down the block from the bad guys and their family. How many people think those witnesses are going to show up in 48 hours, in six months, in 18 months? They may get afraid, they may get threatened, or they may just lose interest. And if they don't show up, the bad guys walk. And then the police have risked their lives for nothing. So we had to build trust between the neighbors and the police, but we also had to build trust between the police and the neighbors. And we did. We built bridges of trust. We started restoring this broken system. And what happened? It worked. Violence went down. Violence went way down. Violence went down 80% in four years. In 2005, we had 42 homicides. Last year, we had seven. We've saved 600 lives in the last 10 years. Our program is now in 10 more neighborhoods. We confronted those abusing power. They got mad. We saved lives. We did justice. And it didn't take too long. It only took four years. You see that drop from 2005 to 2009. It wasn't so hard. We had three staff members. It wasn't too dangerous or too complicated. So let me tell you a second story. The woman in this picture is the president of the National University, Julieta Castellanos. Her university has 80,000 students in Honduras. She's a fabulous woman, one of my heroes. In 2011, the 19-year-old young man in the picture there is her son. He was on his way home from a birthday party with a friend, about 11 o'clock at night, driving home. Eight on-duty police officers in police uniforms, in police cars, stopped them. When they pulled him over, they said, give us your keys, we're stealing your car. He got scared, and he took off in the car instead of giving him the keys, and they chased him in their police cars, shooting at his car. One of the bullets went through his abdomen. When he was shot, he stopped, and he told the police officers, you don't know who I am. My mom is the president of the National University. Why did he tell him, them that? He thought it was going to keep him safe. But you can imagine what these corrupt police officers thought when they figured out they just shot the son of the president of the university. So they called their higher-ups. They said, this is what happened. What should we do? And their bosses said, take him outside of town put them both in a ditch, and shoot them in the back of the head. It's just awful. And what would be our typical response? Our Christian response, our typical response? We'll, we'll visit the morning mother. We'll have a prayer service on campus. We'll raise money to cover the expenses. But what would justice do? So based on our experience in Nueva Suyapa, Julieta called us. We ended up helping the police investigate, and we caught the bad cops. They were arrested. They were convicted. We did justice. 
But that was just the start because we knew that it wasn't just Julieta's case. There were thousands of people in Honduras suffering from this sort of violence. So we formed the Alliance for Peace and Justice in 2012. ASJ, Julieta, the Protestant Church, the Catholic Church, World Vision. Those, those groups don't come together very often either. And we started pushing to get rid of the bad cops. Cops were involved not just in stealing cars, but in murder for hire, in drug trafficking, and organized crime. And once again, we started to, to investigate and we figured out it wasn't so black and white. The problem was not just bad cops. For example, in 2012, San Pedro Sula, it's a city of about a million people in Honduras, it was the most violent city in the world in 2012. There were 22 homicide investigators for a million people. That doesn't sound so unreasonable to me. But they had 30 homicides a week. 22 homicide investigators for 30 homicides a week. Each investigator got one and a half new cases every week. And the worst part, I don't know if it's the worst part, but another bad part, they had two pickup trucks for 22 investigators for 30 homicides every week. So, like, if they were solving homicides, it was miraculous. So it wasn't just that there were bad cops. We needed more cops. We needed more cars. We needed more training. The police also needed our support. So we started developing proposals. We put on pressure. We had press conferences. We don't out in the media. We repeated these facts, Julieta's case and what was happening in San Pedro Sula. Just in 2012, we had 19 meetings with the president. And what happened? After violence had increased in every year from 2005 to 2012, homicides have dropped 40% in just the last three years. And we still have a long way to go, but we have saved 1,400 lives. Seven million Hondurans feel safer. Again, we confronted those abusing power drug traffickers, corrupt police. People got mad, but we did justice. It didn't take so long, just three years. It wasn't too hard. It wasn't too complicated. So I'm going to end with a third story about education. So Carlos and I were worried about the kids in our neighborhood. It seemed like the teachers were always on strike, didn't show up for work, what happens when kids aren't in school? Mom and dad are both working. They end up on the street. They start drinking, start smoking pot, doing drugs, joining gangs, robbing their neighbors, all kinds of bad stuff. So we decided to make this a priority. We formed Transformemos Honduras, or Let's Transform Honduras. It's an alliance of the Protestant, the Catholic Church, World Vision. Again, like bringing together people who don't always get along. And we started investigating, and again, we found stuff that surprised us. I'm going to share just four facts with you. Honduras spends almost 30% of its budget on education. I didn't know that. It's the largest item in their budget. It's the second highest percentage in all of Latin America. So Honduras is investing a lot in education. But the law says that they have to teach 200 days of school. But over the previous 10 years, Honduran kids, on average, only got 125 days of school. That means kids were losing 75, almost half of their school year every year. Imagine what that means when kids are learning to read and write, that they lose half of the school year. And their addition and subtraction, they lose half of that. Then multiplication and division, they lose half of that. Fractions, they... I mean, it's no wonder by the time kids are fourth or fifth grade that they're lost. And the third fact, 26% of the teachers who were on the payroll weren't in the schools where they were supposed to be. Some of them had died and were still getting paychecks. Some of them were in the United States. Lots of them were supposed to be in dangerous schools or rural schools, and they got themselves transferred into nicer, more comfortable urban schools. But that meant out of 60,000 teachers, there were 15,000 teachers in the country, the government had no idea where they were. 
And last, saddest, Honduras for 13 years running was 15 out of 15 in Latin American education. Last place for 13 years. And in 2012, UNESCO, United Nations, I remember hearing this over the radio. UNESCO wrote a report and they said it was going to take Honduras 100 years to catch up to Costa Rica in education. It just made me mad. I remember calling Carlos Hernandez and he had heard the same report and we, were, we just both fumed over. I don't even know if we were talking. There was like fumes going across the, <laughs> the phones. So... Honduras is spending 30% of its budget on education, but they're only getting 125 days of school. 26% of the teachers aren't where they're supposed to be. It's last in Latin America. What would we usually do about that? As Christians, as organizations, say, well, we could do some tutoring in these schools. We could build a private school for some of these kids. We could train teachers better. But what would justice do? Again, justice for me means confronting those abusing power. In this place, it's teachers and politicians and making sure that those poor kids get the education that they deserve. So we again did investigations, proposals. We did press conferences. We got out these facts in the media. We met with the minister of education. We met with the president. We basically got the minister, basically, we got the minister of education fired. The president named a new one. And the president told him his, when he was sworn in, I want you to meet tomorrow with Transformemos Honduras. I don't want any more education scandals. And what happened? Four years later, Honduras is still spending 27% of its budget on education. But where we were getting an average of 120 days of school, we have three years running, 2013, 2014 and 2015, we've averaged 218 days of classes. Imagine, imagine what kids learn in a hundred more days of school. A hundred more days every year of addition and subtraction, of reading and of writing. Not only that, 26% of teachers, we called them ghost teachers because nobody knew where they were. 26% of teachers were ghost teachers. Now it's less than 1%. That means there are teachers back in the classrooms, in the more dangerous neighborhoods, in the, in the less comfortable schools. All of those kids have the teachers they're supposed to have. And most exciting of all, UNESCO came out with a report, October 2015, Honduras, remember, for 13 years running was 15 of 15. In just three years, we jumped, jumped to 10th out of 15. We've gone, <laughs> we've, gone, we've passed the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Panama, and Guatemala. And see Costa Rica up there at the top? We're gunning for them. <laughs> There are 2.3 million kids in Honduran public schools who are now getting a much better education. This is so exciting. <laughs> I just feel so grateful to have been able to be a part of what God is doing through AJS in Honduras, to just have been a little part of these changes. So today I've just told you three stories about what God is, how God is using AJS to make my neighborhood and now 10 more neighborhoods much safer, to now starting to make the whole country safer. Huge improvements in the quantity and in the quality of education. And if I had time, I could tell you a bunch more about how AGS is helping to get more medicines in the hospital, to decrease drug trafficking. There are 80 of the Honduran economic and political elite who have been indicted for corruption, who are waiting for trial just in the last year, and a bunch more. In 2012, the United Nations and the U.S. State Department said that Honduras was on the verge of being a failed state. A failed state means there's nothing we can do here anymore. 
the, the, the whole government is collapsed. They said Honduras was on the verge of being a failed state. Violence seemed out of control. Drug trafficking was unchecked. Education was a mess. Corruption was rampant. And in 2016, there is still so much more work to do. Like, we have not solved these problems. But every one of those trends have changed. We have reason for hope. And and what a privilege to be a part of that. So I'd like to end with four lessons. I I, I got way more, but I'm going to limit it to four today. First, I think we need to think more about what is justice. And I'm convinced not everything is justice. That food pantry, the job training program, water for Africa, those are good things, but for me they're not justice. Justice is about stopping bad people from misusing their power. And it's going to make someone mad. But at the same time, when I talk to some people, justice is often limited to just two or three topics. And justice is much more than those hot topics of today, sex trafficking and child slavery. We need to see justice is much bigger than just those topics. And that there are many more people, poor people, suffering around the world from injustice in education and in health. There are millions living in fear and dying because the police and the courts don't protect them. And oftentimes they're the source of their fear. And we need to do something about that. Second, injustice is not just in Honduras. It's not just in poor countries. I'm going to say something that will not surprise any of you. There is injustice in the United States. I'm going to give you a couple examples that concern me. Four of the the 40 most violent cities in the world are in the United States. St. Louis, Detroit, New Orleans, and Baltimore. They are just behind 200 cities. That is messed up. There is not another city in a rich country on the whole list. The U.S. is the, I'm going to say this a whole bunch of different ways. The U.S. is the only rich country that has a single city on the list, and it has four. It's like all the other rich countries have figured out how to not get on this list. And we haven't figured it out. So it's not just the poor in Honduras suffering from violence. There are poor in the United States who are afraid in the same way. And if I go into Ferguson or Cleveland or Chicago, I know that the neighbors don't trust the police. Just like my neighbors in Honduras don't trust the police. And I bet if I go and interview police officers in Chicago and Ferguson and Cleveland, the police officers don't trust the neighbors, just like Honduras. And I find something about that exciting. Like, maybe the U.S. could learn something from what we're doing in Honduras. Like, we have turned the trend. What if we could help Chicago and Ferguson and Cleveland turn around those trends? Wouldn't that be cool? I'm going to take one more topic that gets a little less attention, our public school systems. So I've been doing data research. I'm not even going to be able to say I'm positive about these statistics. But the school district that I could find with legitimately the highest cost per pupil is Pontico Hills, New York. The best data I could find, they spend $79,000 per student per year. There are two dozen school districts in New York State, so I tried to relatively apples and apples, that spend less than $6,000 per student per year. $79,000 per student a year, $6,000 per student per year. And we probably don't need to go so far away. Let's compare East Grand Rapids High School and Grand Rapids Central. And these are all public schools. That's messed up. That's crazy. 
And which are the kids that most need a really good public school? The ones in Grand Rapids Central. The ones in the $6,000 school district, I guarantee it, those are the kids that really need a good public school. And who are the kids? Who are the kids that least need that really expensive public school? East Grand Rapids, Pontico Hills, New York. Because their parents can afford all sorts of tutoring and extras and travel teams. So again, wouldn't it be cool if the U.S. could learn something about how we in Honduras are fighting injustice in the public education system. So this makes me happy. Not in a pure happy sort of way, but a, in happy, none the way. it feels more right. Because when I talk about poverty and wealth, poverty and development, it's always that Honduras has to learn something from the United States, from rich countries. But when we talk about justice, it's much less of a us them. The U.S. can learn from what we're doing in Honduras, how to make a more just security system or education system, and that makes me happy. Third, we need to stop listening to our culture's lie that our safety and our comfort should be our top priority. And here I want to credit a friend, Joel Hammernick. It is clear when we look at the life of Jesus, the life of the apostles, the life of the prophets, their number one priority was following God's call. To do justice, to heal brokenness. And that involved risk. That often involved making people mad. But our culture... Even our Christian culture says, yeah, you know, I know God would be happy if I tried to fix that public school thing or the the brokenness and violence in Detroit. If I moved into the inner city and started working on that violence and police stuff, I know God would be happy, but it's dangerous. It's scary. And then what I found to be the killer question You know, I would be willing, but what about my kids? I can't expose my kids to that sort of risk. Where would they go to school? How would I keep them safe? And and I I think people who know me, I'm I'm not suggesting we be stupid, that we take unnecessary risks, but we know that God is calling us to heal the brokenness in our world. God is calling us to enter the places where there's violence and corruption. And I think we need to show our culture. We need to show our Christian culture. I think we even need to show our children that honoring God's call is more important than maximizing our comfort or minimizing our risk. And finally, we need to stop believing the lie that doing justice, that changing systems, that stopping corruption and violence are too hard, are too complicated, that it's going to take too long. That is exactly what the corrupt and the criminals want us to believe. And we also have to stop believing the lie that somehow by creating parallel systems, by setting up orphanages and private clinics and schools, that that's going to be so much easier and so much faster. It's not. We took on the gangs in our neighborhood, the drug traffickers, the organized crime, the teachers union, the politicians. And in three or four years, we've seen significant results. And it's not always going to be that way. AJS is 17 years old. We've worked on a bunch of issues for those whole 17 years, and we haven't seen any results. Even when there's no results, God calls us to act justly. And God has promised he will be on our side. Almost made it. 
So God is calling me and you to act justly. The question is, are we willing? I'd like to ask for you today for your support for AJS, your prayers and your support as we continue to fight to bring hope and justice to Honduras. But I also want to challenge you to start talking about what doing justice means where you live. And especially to consider the violence and the broken justice systems around you. We need to ask, who are those abusing power around us? Who is being hurt? And what can we do about it? And then we need to start doing justice. I'd like to end with two quotes. First from Gary Haugen. Our efforts to end global poverty and secure the most basic human rights for the poor are failing. I'll repeat, are failing because crime and violence against the poor are not being addressed. And Micah 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of us but to act justly and to love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Thank you. him in the light today. If you have questions, you may write them on the cards and hold them up and Usher will pick them up. You may tweet them or email them. We have a question on Twitter from one of our alumni and I'll try to focus it a little more narrowly than he does. Um, can you talk a bit about the systemic issues in history that have led to Honduras having so much violence and corruption? And you talked with our students this morning about the drug trade and it's, it's shaping that. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll say two things. Um, one is Gary Haugen, uh, who I quote here at the end, has a fabulous book about this called The Locust Effect. And so if, if you haven't read it and you're interested in this, I highly recommend it. And it talks a lot about not just Honduras, but around the world, how justice and security systems were always set up to protect the elite. They were not set up to protect the average person. And they have been very effective for the last 200 years in doing what they were set up to do and effective in not doing what they weren't supposed to do. Uh, but yes, in Honduras, in 2005, if you remember the graph, homicides were about 35 per 100,000. So that's high, was average for Latin America. In seven years, it went from 35 to 86. It almost, the homicide rate tripled in seven years. And during exactly those same seven years, the drug trafficking quadrupled in Honduras. Now the homicide rate is dropping in Honduras, and the drug trade in Honduras, and I can get into more of the why, but the violence in Honduras is directly connected to drug trafficking, and the drug trafficking is directly connected again to us, because all of those drugs, it's all cocaine, is coming up to the United States. And so I'm really happy. Homicides are down 40% in Honduras. Guess what? They're up 60% in El Salvador. El Salvador is now going to be the number one highest homicide rate in the world. So the drugs trade is leaving Honduras. It's moving into El Salvador, Guatemala, Belize, the Dominican. So we're not really fixing the problem. We're fixing Honduras. We're squeezing the balloon. And it just goes somewhere else. So until we address this whole issue of, of drugs and our consumption of drugs, the, the violence is just going to be moving from one country to another. So ultimately, the, the solution lies in changing policies in the United States. Would you talk a little bit about the growth of your organization in terms of its demographics, in terms of staffing over the years? Nice. Thanks for setting me up for that one. Uh, one of the things I said this morning that I often feel uncomfortable as a North American speaking about AJS 
so I'm one of the founders, but I'm one of six. Uh, the rest are Honduran, well, Joanne and I, and the rest are all Honduran. And our staff is now about 130. And I think we have four or five non-Hondurans out of those whole 130. So there is a whole bunch of brave Honduran Christians, brave Honduran Christian lawyers and investigators and psychologists doing really cool, exciting stuff. And they're really the brave people getting all this stuff done. And uh, we used to have a hard time finding people because one of our lawyers was killed. Several of our staff have had death threats. So people were nervous. We have no trouble anymore finding staff. We have if we have an opening, we'll get 20, 30 applicants. And that's also exciting. Like, people want to come work for us. People want to be a part, as Christians, of changing the future of their country, and that's exciting. On Monday, we heard Leroy Barber and yesterday the Salgueros talking about the difference between learning and doing, between listening and speaking, and the importance of listening first. How have you balanced the need to listen and learn as a PhD, as a foreign-born Mm -hmm. Honduran, with the requirement to act justly? Mm -hmm. Nice question. Hard ones. Uh, so part of being a North American and involved in leading an organization like this, it, it, it's always messy. And I think I almost always feel uncomfortable. And I think part of that's good, right? Like, I think sometimes it's good when we're not comfortable. And uh, AGS, I'm probably one of, of three or four people who are running AGS. And every day I feel like my role is less important. And there's two people, especially Carlos Hernandez and Omar Rivera, who are just so smart about all of this stuff. And whenever I have to make a decision, like they're not around, I'm always uncomfortable and I always wish, let's wait till tomorrow when they're gonna be back in the office and we could decide this together. Um, and as far as listen, so that's part of listening, but I think a, a huge thing that has changed how we see the world and what we do was when we moved up into Nueva Suyapa. So we lived in a middle class neighborhood and we moved into this community and we had been going to church there already for about 20 years. And I think living in a violent, poor dangerous neighborhood has helped us in so many ways under, like, you know, going to church with people, but, but living there. And like our kids also lived there. And we knew what they felt like when their kids had to walk back and forth to church or back and forth to school and, you know, wanting to walk alongside of them and knowing what. And, and so I think just, and, and that's maybe like one of the things I encourage lots of you, but especially young people, like think about living for a time in the inner city or in, or in more marginal, less privileged places and how that will shape how you see the world and, and how you understand how to fix it. Thank you. What are, this is from a student. What are practical steps students can take to become involved in a profession that truly fights for justice in the United States? Is any kind of degree necessary? <laughs> English, I would say. <laughs> Sociology. Uh, I, I guess I think that the most important thing, and I, I think most professors would agree, like that we always remain curious, like that we're, we're never satisfied, like we figured it all out, that we always want to keep learning. And, and so how do we get that spiritual curiosity, like that we're never satisfied, like you know, oh yeah, now I'm acting justly. I'm, I'm, I'm walking humbly with my God. I got that all done. Like there, we're, 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 we're always not quite satisfied there. And also when, when we're trying to do justice, like how to just keep, you know, what's going on in Chicago with violence in the police force. How do we just keep learning and reading and talking to people and not think that we got it all figured out? And I, th I think if you just keep that, curiosity, it will take you a long ways. Would you say what you said this morning about how long it takes? Yesterday, the Salgueros talked about the danger of romanticizing justice. Uh, it's hard. 
How, how long do you go before you give up, yeah. Kurt? So, <laughs> my main point today was trying to convince all of you that changing systems and fighting violence and corruption was not too hard, too difficult, was going to take too long. And I, I did try and soften that a little bit at the end, that it doesn't, but we don't always see quick results, and it isn't always easy, and, and that is also, at the same time, very true. So I was saying this morning that I uh, read a book recently that was written by uh, John Perkins and Shane Claiborne. And one of the questions Shane asked John was, uh, what do you tell young people when they say they want to get involved in changing the world? And he said, I always tell them the same thing, that they have to commit to something for at least 10 years, and they probably won't see almost no results for those whole first 10. I was like, wow. <laughs> and then I thought back on the history of AJS, and AJS is 17 years old, and we, we did some stuff. I mean, we got a few things done those first 10 years, but I think he's basically right. We were, those whole first 10 years, we were learning, we were messing up, we were figuring out what we wanted to do and how, and it was really in the 11th and 12th, and it's really like 15, 16, 17 that we're hitting our stride. And I think the trouble is, is that often our attention span isn't that long, right? Especially young people, but even older people. Like, a, like if we did something for six months in a year and it hasn't worked, like, uh, we're done with that. So how do we commit to, to neighborhoods, to issues, to, to organizations for the long haul. Thanks. I'm going to end with a student's request that you write a book so that people all over the world <laughs> need to learn these lessons. And to say thank you again. Thank you.